doorstep with e-commerce orders, we're, we're switching them to something uh, more sustainable, lower impact. Uh, that's a, a, you know, a pretty easy thing, I think, for most people to connect to. And, and there's a lot of frustration around how much packaging you're using. The reality is that, of course, underneath that, it's, it's a lot more complicated. But um, I think at first blush, just be able to tell people, we're, we're helping rid of single-use cardboard boxes. Uh, that, that gets me a lot of attention at parties, I think. People, people are tired of packaging. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure for just anybody you meet, they can understand that. And it's probably always been like that, but I'm guessing since, you know, basically 2020 with, I assume, I mean, it's just been even more heightened with, I mean, it feels like the packaging that's showing up at your doorstep has just increased because we were locked in and that was the way you got things. I mean, so I'm sure there's a, a bigger appreciation or maybe interest in what you're doing nowadays. Yeah, and I think that can cut two ways. I mean, you know, people definitely are buying more online, getting more delivered at home, and, and the waste issue is only ex accelerated. But um, unfortunately, a lot of those use models aren't actually a great fit for reuse. Even though you can make packaging that that actually gets the job done really well, uh, the challenge is it has to stay in circulation at a really high level. It has to do that at a really low cost. It's just packaging. It's not a lot of room for expense and and an error there. And it makes it hard to sort of satisfy that urge that we all have as consumers and as uh, members of you know society who are concerned about the planet and, and how we're consuming things. Reuse has its role. It, it doesn't fix all the problems just by itself. So that that is, uh, uh, sometimes I have to be a bit of a bummer. I got to explain why it's not happening is because um, it's more complicated than just making a really cool reusable matrix. I mean, logistics is complicated enough. So, I mean, yeah, you start adding these layers to it, it's going to get complex. What are what are some of the um, industries or maybe brands uh, or products or services or in use cases where you say it, it it's a uh, it's an easy sell there? Like, it makes a lot of sense. There's going to be enough reuse. Logistics are not a huge hurdle. Where are you seeing that with kind of like your initial customer base or some other industries where there's interest in it? Well, yeah, and our first our first markets really were the fashion rental companies like Rent the Runway and, and others um, who have a you know it's just a real natural fit for reuse. They're sending you something; you're always sending it back. So it's it's a real simple integration. Um, challenge is that it's a tiny part of our overall shipping world. So for us, it's really been about understanding well why does it work in that context, and where can you find similar um, models uh, that also can have that level of circularity and level of cost efficiency. And um, it's not it's not where people think. It's not generally just regular e-commerce. It's not just buying a pair of jeans one day from a website and having it come in a reasonable bag. It's really about where do you have a natural um, level of circulation already or a, enough control as a company to make sure it stays in circulation. Um, it ends up being a lot of internal logistics, like how products are moving between warehouses and stores. Um, it's it's um, a lot of food and beverage delivery, which is, you know, as you said before, you know, uh, pandemic changes, like that's a huge change and how often people now are getting food delivered to their home. That level of like high frequency, high engagement, you know, there's certain building blocks that we're now looking for and helping retailers sort of carve out. Where, where are those placements? where reuse can really have legs and where is it going to be more of a struggle just because of the, the, you know, the nature of how they're, how they're moving. Things. Yeah. I mean, it is super interesting to think about where, it, where it's going to be a challenge and where, okay, I think this is very possible. It could be a big benefit. Um, what are some of the customers and partners that you have right now where you say, Oh, this, this is just getting going. I mean, this is early days, but this could be big. I mean, there's, as soon as we prove this out to a certain level, like we can really take this and go with it. Like what are, what are the ones that you think are most promising? Well, there, if you live in Philly, DC, Miami, or Atlanta, you may know about a company called The Rounds, which is doing this, this reuse and, and um, really sustainable grocery delivery service. Uh, we make the bags that they use for how they deliver all, the, all those groceries to the customers. We help facilitate how they're collected and cleaned and, and used again. And, and that kind of grocery delivery model is growing so quickly. And the number of bags that are used is, you know, as people know, I mean, when you get your groceries, you can get 10, 20 of those little single use poly bags. Um, that's what the rounds has done has been really exciting. And then 
come this spring, we're going to be in a bunch of major retailers for a sort of first phase program, something a bit similar. And so I think that grocery space is, is one of the sort of new frontiers where reusable bags is something consumers, I think, are used to seeing, used to using in a number of different ways. But that's sort of been on them to remember to bring them or to pay for them at checkout. Uh, some of the systems for how those bags are now kind of being controlled by the retailers and how we're helping facilitate that um, is one area that I think people are going to see sooner than they may have anticipated. And, and we're really excited. I have a feeling that there's times where you get in conversations and there are people who have good intentions. They like what you're doing. They want to use it themselves, but maybe they've underestimated the complexities, the logistical hurdles that they're going to overcome. Are there certain, I don't know, misperceptions or misconceptions about what you guys provide and, you know, basically the ease of it. Are there certain things that you're hearing from people and you're like, okay, we'd love to help, but that's actually a little bit more difficult than you think it is. Yeah, I think that the, the, most people think it's a packaging problem. Can you make me a bag or box that's going to get the job done? And, and I think at this point, you know, we've moved everything from shoes to clothes to wine to groceries. I mean, you know, we did it for a sofa bag, like a reasonable delivery bag. It's, it's really not a packaging issue. It's a system issue. And the thing that people, we all sort of underestimated is for reuse to make sense, both economically, but more, most importantly, environmentally. If you're going to make it switch to reasonable, you better be doing it to help the planet. It's, it's a key driver. They really got to re be reused a lot. And a lot means like 90 to 95% return rate. Uh, and that just, you know, frankly, does not happen in a sort of general consumer use model. Uh, a lot of consumers will do it, but uh, it's got to be 90, 95%. It's hard to get 90, 95% of people to do anything. Uh, and it's not about blaming consumers either. They're so used to how they, you know, how products arrive at their home and how they engage with retailers, that that's a big consumer behavior change. I think a lot of brands have underestimated how hard it will be to get that kind of change in behavior and how long that might take. And so for us, it's been uh, not being too um, negative when they come to us because, you know, I think they really want to make changes because they care about the planet as much as, as everybody. But helping them identify like where are the easier problems today to solve getting your customers to kind of wholesale move to a new model that's going to take some time yeah i mean as somebody who's worked in marketing my whole career my it's been one to many like that's what we do and so when you talk about like reverse logistics the idea of getting the many to bring it back to the one like that just makes my head hurt you know i mean <laughs> you have so many different people with different circumstances different habits uh and to sort of form a new habit and, and to get the uptick, like you said, of, you know, high nineties to do that. That's, that's tough. It's tough. And, and I think that what we prefer as a company, because it's worked for us, but we also are just really aggressive about communicating is that we think reuse wins. If we build off of a platform of success, rather than trying to go to the end state, which is going to be hard and take time and get people frustrated and disappointed. So, uh, you know, this idea of the modern milkman and, you know, it's sort of getting a lot of hype right now that we're going to go back to this old model, but the old model never really worked the way people are saying the modern milkman would work today either. So that, that kind of like hope and believe idea, um, we think sometimes actually sets things back. And instead, there are these segments of the operations that retailers have. There's behaviors that consumers already exhibit and participate in that are great class placements for reuse. And it might not solve the whole problem overnight, but now everybody's getting used to something that's working and they can grow from that uh, as opposed to just getting frustrated. And walking away. So I could be wrong, but it seems to me that whenever you have a potential partner who is, is talking to you about your solution, there's probably a level of consultation of, is this going to be successful in the terms of the number of reuse, the number, the percentage of return? There's probably case studies that you're maybe sharing with them to saying like, this is how it worked for some is maybe how it didn't work for others. Like, is, is that kind of what those initial conversations look like for your team? Yeah, they definitely are. And we don't, nobody goes from zero to a million. It's always, uh, you know, generally we'll do a, a very limited pilot with clients, um, which, and it's reuse. So you have to let it run for a while. You have to get a number of cycles to learn what's working and what's not. And so, 
it, it can take a year, a year and a half or longer in some instances before you go through enough iteration and learning and trial before you can start to really scale out the use. And at the end of the day, like that's the only way to do it. Um, so it, for us as a company, it can be frustrating because we want to move faster. We want to grow faster. But when you do it that way, the, the confidence in us as a provider and reuse as, a, as an alternative just becomes really strong. And it's a much better way of developing it. Um, that's why for all, you know, there's every company under the sun, it seems to set some really aggressive packaging goals as far as switching to reusables and recycle and everything. And usually with 2025 kind of being the, the deadline, well, we're about to turn into 2023 as we're recording this, like companies are running out of time to get started and learn. And, that, and that's the thing is it's not a one shot uh, approach. You have to invest in learning and you have to start now if you want to get somewhere. Yeah, that makes sense. Get the get the test cycles in and see what's possible. And if it's a dead end, it's a dead end, and you know, um, or you understand like what it's going to take to make it work, right? That's right. And don't overinvest in in any one approach and any one idea. I mean, there's always misconception. It's like you know, reasonable packaging is no different than any other sort of new product or service investment that companies make. They should treat it with the same rigor, the same analysis, the same market research, the same testing, like you shouldn't do it differently. Cause just because it's about the planet doesn't mean you should throw all that smart process out the window. You should use the same process and come out of it with the confidence that you made the right bet. So at this point, you've, you've no doubt overcome some obstacles that were pretty tough at this point uh, for eternity. What, what are some of the things when you look back, you're proud of that you've kind of overcome or maybe some wins that you were able to hit? um at this point well I, yeah i can think of a few i mean the 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 obstacle to overcome was was definitely the pandemic uh we had a, the first week of march of 2020 we were um we, we were called into a, a customer's offices we didn't really know what the point of the meeting was and they told us they were given us exclusivity to make all their packaging for the next year it was going to be a, a two and a half million dollar contract and a million dollar order that day and they and we were all excited and uh, we thought, you know, for a startup, like that is a huge moment. And uh, we left all excited. And of course, one week later, the entire world shut down and that contract was torn into little pieces. So we kind of went from our highest high to our lowest low and had like so many other companies, we really had to scrape and, you know, PPP loans and not paying ourselves and all whatever it took to stay alive. So that was a real uh, kick in the teeth, that sort of highest high, lowest low. Uh, since then, we've we've you know we've fortunately been able to recover, and it made us get smarter um, about how and where we're selling and who who we're trying to to partner with. Um, a really big moment for us was to see our client Happy Returns get into every FedEx location. So now you can go to any FedEx in America, and our boxes are behind the counter where you can return uh, e-commerce orders via Happy Returns, and our packaging is running that whole system. Uh, so when I'm walking down the street and I see a FedEx driver like wheeling our boxes from the store to his truck, I mean, that's exciting. You see your stuff, field, you know, it's working, you know, it's at scale now like that. And that really only came about after that low, low in the pandemic and us really doubling down what we knew could work and thrive in, in our new sort of uh, world post pandemic. Yeah. I forget what I was doing in a FedEx, but it was, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago. Um, and I saw the happy returns, big logo on the box without even knowing what it was, just seeing it sit there. I had a guess at what that was. I'm like, this is brilliant. Like this, this should definitely have been a thing even before now, but obviously, you know, with everybody sitting at home ordering things, like it made a lot of sense. I didn't. And then here recently got to know Returnity, saw the logo there. I'm like, oh, this makes sense. But that it's just, sometimes you see something that it so obviously makes sense. You're just happy that someone finally, you know, brought it along so we can all do that thing now. Yeah, I mean, their customers love it. And for us, it's uh, it's a perfect use case for reusable boxes that just stay in circulation. They're, you know, they're not using cardboard. The, the employees love it because they're easy to use. It's not, you know, it's like if I had sat uh, at a table and said, what are the hundred things we could think of for reuse reasonable shipping packaging is going to make sense. I don't know that this would have gotten there if we were coming up with it. Uh, so we we're lucky to be able to have happy returns, you know, approach us. 
And then in hindsight, you're like, of course, like it's a perfect little niche of the logistics world. It totally makes sense for reuse. And and the longer we work on this problem, the more often we're finding it. Like like with New Balance, there's they have a sponsored sports team. So all the high school and college and professional teams they sponsor, they're always sending out product samples for them to test, evaluate, and send back to them. And they used to just do it in cardboard. And now they're doing it in specially designed New Balance bags and boxes. And everyone at New Balance and all the teams love it. And they're like, oh, of course, sample shipping. Like, you know, is that top of mind for anybody? Only those teams. But like, it really works in that segment. So our ability to sort of sniff out these little parts of the economy where reuse already happens, whether people intended it or not, uh, has been one of the fun fun things to kind of work through as a company. Yeah. I mean, you guys have been at this for a while, but it seems to me that you're just getting started because of the opportunity is just, and the need is is so great. What do you see as maybe the next milestone or the next thing to be pushing towards that you're, you know, kind of looking forward to or actively working on right now? Yeah, I think we've been around uh, long enough to be an overnight success. So I'm proud to, to have that uh, uh, hit for us. Um, I think that what's going to come next is is really that all of a sudden it feels like the regulatory environment is going to shove uh, all these things into a place that are it's not necessarily, frankly, ready for. Um, and I think that's what's going to be a really interesting thing over the next two or three years. So we've, as a company, I think in the industry more broadly, have have been growing through kind of what we've been talking about, these finding these you know niches. Um, and building off of those, all of a sudden you're seeing re- regulations starting to force the entire system to do things differently and do it at a pretty massive scale. So like in the EU, the draft that just came out a few weeks ago, it's like 20% of all shipping packaging reusable by the end of the decade. Well, that is a huge lift. So I think consumers are going to have to be a part of that ride. It's not just about companies throwing in the reusable. It's about how everybody works together on that. And so how government, consumer, and companies all collaborate on this new kind of paradigm over the next four or five years, I think is going to be fascinating. And um, it's going to accelerate a lot. of things. So all, all the talk about reuse, all of a sudden, it's going to have to become a reality for companies and consumers alike, and governments are going to enforce it. So um, that's going to create change in ways that are hard to predict, but seem somewhat inevitable. What what would you say? This is this may be different for every industry, but what would you say consumers' appetite for sort of behavior change and new habits is? My guess is that there's a percentage that welcome it and they're like, "Oh, this is exciting." There's others that are like, "What change? No thanks." I mean, what what are you seeing? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, the problem with um, I think in general, there's two things that I see and sort of have to roll my eyes at, if I'm being honest. The first is that reuse companies who put out there like how many times their packaging can be reused. If they were using the word can, it's because the word is being reused is not a good enough number for them to want to brag about. Right? So like they're talking about how cool their system is, but not how often people are actually using it the way it's designed. And similarly, then with consumers, you can survey them and say how many would prefer buying from and who has a willingness to pay and what is their sensitivity. And those numbers keep going up. And I'm glad they should. You know, we need them to go up. But that doesn't often translate into profound change in behavior. So I, I'm, I'm a skeptic about it, not because I think consumers are lazy or you know trying to blame people. I, I think that that is a... Um, an unfortunate framing that a lot of people give is that, well, if consumers were just, well, you know, this is a society level issue. And I know lots of people who are really passionate about the planet. And then if you drill down and say, well, are you buying less online? Then they'll say, well, no, like, well, you know, so what, which is it? Or do you drive an SUV? Well, yeah, but like, I'm tired of getting packed. Well, okay. But if then you're tired of these things, then where's your personal change? Uh, I think that, Ultimately, packaging is the least important thing most of us will deal with on any given day. And if it's the least important thing, you should not expect people to be invested in profound changes in how they interact. And so um, you have to make it simple. You have to meet them where they are. You have to be realistic. And when you do that, you can still have profound change. I think you can have smarter change and you can really best um, consider the problem. Just but you know, expecting all of a sudden people to be different is—it's you know, there's just not evidence for it. 
That's what I liked about the happy returns whenever I saw it the first time was like, this appears to be making things easier, which is really key, right? Like if, if it takes an extra step, you can count on a lot of people not doing it, but if it, it eases something, it, it, people will do it. People do, we all do what's easy. And so that, that feels like that's pretty key is, is showing how easy it could be in many cases. Yeah. And car, you know, I say cardboard is smart, is, uh, is cheap. It's dumb. And it's easy, which is what makes it great. I mean, you know, like, you know, you want to get mad about cardboard, but cardboard is successful because of its attributes. Like it, it, it is successful for a reason. And so that's right. If you want to make reuse successful, you have to give people a really compelling reason and, um, you know, sort of opt in and virtue signaling kind of idea, this conscientious consumption approach to solving environmental problems. Yes, there are people who will who will seek that out and, and live that lifestyle. And, you know, it's often commendable, but um, it's not what my mom is going to do. She's got a busy day. It's not what, frankly, I'm going to do. And I work in the industry. So I think you have to be realistic and you have to give people meaningful incentives to change. Uh, sometimes that can be regulatory because I got to, or there's fines or penalties or others. But like otherwise, um, it, it's just a bag or box. And if you overstate what that means in society, you're likely going to miss the boat on, on creating a successful scale alternative. Yeah. What are, what are some of the things that you're hearing from customers or that make you, you know, proud of the progress that you've made to date or, or just anything that you've seen related to, you know, the company and what you're, you're putting out? Well, I think it's been really exciting for us on, on a couple of levels. The first is that um, we've, we've started winning awards and kind of being cited and get and and um, getting invited to speak at conferences. I mean, that that is that always feels good. We we like being behind the scenes as far as the work we do for retailers, but kind of getting that public recognition, at least within the industry, is is really validating and and helpful. Um, I think the other part of it is just, you know, we say subsidies don't scale. We care about growing as a company for our, our stakeholders, our investors, but we also care because when we grow, we're helping the planet. And a lot of that has come back to, to the, this idea that reuse only is better if you really reuse at a very high level. And so some of the language that we have shared and some of the sort of the, the white papers and things like that we put forward, we're starting to see the industry adopt some of that language too and acknowledge that if you don't have a really high rate of return in reuse, um, you're not really helping. Um, and that's been validating too. So, I, you know, I think it's five plus years of at times banging our heads against a wall or, or having to navigate through uh, global health crises where, you know, that, there were clearly more important issues to be focused on as a society. But to start to see things kind of lining up how, how we've really felt uh, is needed in, in this part of the world has been, been really exciting. Mm -hmm.